today we're going to talk about social relations or more specifically we're going to talk about mating and how different sexes organize their resources for mating. So by the end of this lecture I hope you can define fitness, assessment, sexual selection both intersexual and intrasexual although that might be a little more on Wednesday and of course nuptial gift. Be able to list methods of assessing a mate and be able to give examples. Differentiate between intrasexual and intersexual selection. Again, that might be a little more of the next lecture. List the costs and benefits to sexual selection and list costs and benefits to what we call nuptial gifts. So let's start off with some terminology. So these are kind of loaded terms in today's culture, but we're going to simplify it and call that which we, that which we call male is simply the sperm donor or the pollen donor. That which we call female is simply the egg donor or the ovule donor, depending if you're talking about plants or animals. And that can change over time. Here we see some wrasse, and the wrasse can actually turn from male to female, and their development is pretty, um, well, pretty back and forth. And what we have here is some flowers, and these flowers actually have both male and female parts. So we can refer to it as either or both. So we're going to start off by talking about how mating must be optional. We can see these bull elk here fighting each other. They're spending energy to grow their antlers, to rut, to bellow, and of course to fight. In doing so, they're using resources that could be used towards other things. And of course, they're making themselves more obvious to predators or hunters. And in fighting, they're expending energy that could be used doing other things. If you remember your allocation model, if you could spend energy elsewhere, we have to ask why you're spending energy here. And we know that the female will ultimately just choose one bull, and many females will actually choose the same bull, and that will be the bull that can fend off the most competitors. Males, in doing all of these activities, will gain what we call fitness, which is a higher number of offspring. So fitness is the relative contribution, relative genetic contribution, to the next generation. But what do females gain from having the best bull elk? Well, this is a question about sperm versus egg size. We know that sperm are very much smaller than an egg, as you can see in this figure below. This is a reflection of the female and male investment. Females invest a larger cell. Males invest smaller cells. But there's something else that females are often investing in providing the layers of nutrition for the egg, or the shell of the egg, or the care of the egg, or the care of the offspring, or in mammals, even milk. What else are males investing? Well, that can really vary. And that variance is what's going to make an investment differential. An investment differential is what powers sexual selection. If the males are putting a lot on the table and the females are putting a lot on the table, we're not going to see much sexual selection because it benefits both of them to just choose the best mate about equally. But if the males are giving very little and the females are giving a lot, like with the elk, where the male just gives, well, sperm and a certain amount of protection, and the female is going to invest in the gestation, invest in the um, lactation, and invest in the raising of the calf, this means the male has much less to give than the female does. So females should be choosier in that matter to get the best possible genes. So this is all, of course, optimal, much like optimal foraging. And we're going to look at this in terms of intersexual selection. Intersexual selection is when females choose males or when males are choosing females. And we can see here the peacock's tail. This is great ornamentation. And for the male, this ornamentation will come at a price in terms of other attributes. There's maintenance to make that large tail. And the maintenance, or to keep that large tail, and make and keep, and that could be used elsewhere. The proteins put into all of those feathers could have been put into musculature. There is a caloric intake and uh, input in the amount of time that it has to be spent preening that gigantic tail, as well as, of course, creating it. And there's a risk of predation. The tail is heavy and will slow down and escape. So for the male, the cost in resources must be less than the gain that they're going to get in fitness. So they need to be able to invest a lot into these resources to make themselves look better in order to gain fitness. And we will see with higher, in, higher investment differentials, we'll see a higher and higher investment of the males into their display, 
rather than into their offspring. So here's a good test of concept for this intersexual selection. We're going to see these tests in the in a greenhouse environment or, you know, kind of a laboratory environment for the hypothesis that predation is selecting against decoration. So these guppies can be more or less spotted on their tails. The more spotted ones are going to be more attractive to the females, but that's also going to represent a cost in terms of being more visible to predators. So we would hypothesize that in the presence of high amounts of predation, the males are going to be less colored. But in the presence of no predation, the males are going to invest more into their uh, display. So they put these, these guppies into different pools. And in these high predation pools, they added pike cichlid. So over time, they saw in these pools a decreased color in male guppies because they have to balance the display against a high level of predation. In a low predation one, they actually just added something that is <coughs> not as severe as a predator. <coughs> and they actually saw increased color in the male guppies because it was worth more to put the spots on and you wouldn't be preyed on as much, and you'd still attract mates. And in no predation, they just put a bunch of guppies in a pond, and they saw that there was increased color in the male guppies because they didn't have to worry about increasing their visibility towards a predator. This was backed up by field observations confirming the laboratory experiment. We, they, the researchers went to some actual streams with the pike cichlids, with the rivulets, or with nothing, and they saw what do the guppies look like in nature, and then the brilliant part of this experiment is they moved guppies from one pool to another. So they took a founder population that had a certain number of spots per male, about 10, and they brought it into an area, and then they added predators, or they could add predators to an already existing pool of guppies. And what they saw is that whenever predation increased, the number of spots on the male guppy would decrease. That's really showing that the investment into spots comes at a cost of predation. To better confirm this theory, this was evolutionarily reversed. The removal of the pike cichlids from the pond returned sexual selection as the primary factor that was actually making the guppies invest in things, and they actually increased the number of total spots. So let's think, what could be a future evolutionary trajectory for the population if they were to continue under low or no predation. And there are actually some really good papers written on this that some seniors presented uh, last year, showing that the guppies actually increase the visibility of their spots even. So now we're going to look at, it's not just spots, but how do the females actually assess their mates? And this assessment comes in six different forms. We're going to move through these one by one. So kind of to give you the look out, there's the courtship rituals, nuptial gifts, parental care, territory, appearance, and imprinting. This right here is a scorpion fly with a dead bug and a dead moth. And if you're wondering why it's carrying that moth, let's look. But not right now. First, we're going to look at courtship rituals. Here are some blue-footed boobies. And the male booby is showing his blue feet to the female booby. This allows the female booby to assess the health of the male. Torn up, parasite-ridden feet, are indicated, indicative of a not very healthy male. And a female does not want to mate with a not very healthy male because she will not get good genes. This also maintains species boundaries. There are black-footed boobies and red-footed boobies in the same area. And if a red-footed booby shows his feet, the blue-footed booby female will go, wait, 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 I'm not into that. Courtship rituals can also involve other things because I just said the feet, that's appearance. And uh, we're going to look at some nuptial gifts or other means of assessment that can be included within the courtship rituals. In a promiscuous species, which means a species that does not form long-term pair bonds, the ritual is the only thing the male does. The male just gives the ritual, the female sees the ritual, assesses the male at how well they do the ritual, mates and leaves, and the male does nothing else except give a ritual and, well, sperm, which don't cost a lot. What about nuptial gifts, something that does cost a lot? Here we have our scorpion flies. And the mate is going to get nutrients while they are mating. In fact, the larger the gift, often the more time the female spends eating it and the more time the male has to mate with her. The increased amount of uh, gift and the increased nutrients in the gift can actually increase the egg output of the females. 
This also indicates the suitor's foraging ability. Males that can capture moth are obviously better than males that can't capture anything. And the males here will actually sometimes just give their own saliva as a gift. It's better than nothing, but it's also the worst gift. So the bigger the cricket in this case, the bigger the cricket, the more likely they were to mate. So the higher mating success if they have a larger nuptial gift. We also see parental care as a means of assessment. Here are some bald eagles. I actually have some bald eagles up there in one of the trees, uh, not right now, but often, and they will come back and nest every year. But if the male does not take good care of the young, the female will just leave him. So there's this little nest cam, it showed a male and a female, and the chicks got eaten by ravens two years in a row, and the female left him because he was not doing a good job of parental care. So mates that can't care for the offspring are just abandoned. There's also territory. If this sunbird here is able to defend a territory with plentiful resources, be it a large territory with a lot of good flowers or a small territory with a lot of great flowers, then it's a good male. And that indicates good genes. And that indicates a good nest in a good neighborhood, which means good resources to raise the young and something the female will be willing to invest in. So we can actually see sunbird territories varying not just in size, but also in nectar availability, where sometimes a sunbird has a small territory with just a real lot of good juicy plants. Appearance is also important. Good genes are what leads to that good appearance. It is a good bet on the part of the female cardinal that that male cardinal, he gets his red color from a good healthy diet, which means this male is able to forage for a good healthy diet because he's not busy running away from predators. There's also the sexy sons hypothesis, that this male cardinal is attractive, and his sons will be attractive, which means his sons will have higher fitness. So the female investing in this is going to have offspring that they themselves will have more offspring. Appearance can also indicate the, how well the immune system is functioning, a lack of parasites. And also increase, it tells about the diet and therefore is kind of a hint at the territory. Last, we have imprinting. So this is where a bird, or well, anything really, will mate with things that look more like their parents. And this was tested very well. This actually ensures species specificity because this is what your parents look like. They're of the same species. This is your mate. He looks like he's of the same species. Cool. So they actually put hats on the birds and the chicks raised by birds with hats. The females would prefer birds with hats over birds without hats. The males it doesn't matter because they're not investing as much. This can lead to a subspecies occasionally or kind of a subculture. And this is actually hypothesized to be one of the reasons for races and humans that they imprinted on their parents and mated with other humans who looked more like them. So those are the six different types of assessment, which are all types of intersexual selection. Intrasexual selection is when you basically just have males fighting it out, and that fighting within a sex is intrasexual. Or females battling it out for access to the best mates, that is intrasexual, within a sex. So that's part one of social relations.